Facebook Live. Um, welcome to you as well. Um, yeah, I, ho- I hope you guys are blessed. Listen, I was like, I was studying and preparing this week, and I had a whole big chunk of scripture to preach. And as I was preparing, as I was like reading through and studying for it, I just realized I think it was going to be too big of a bite for us to really be able to chew on in a meaningful way this morning. So I've actually, if, if you looked at the emails, if you don't, you didn't even know that I changed it. But if you looked at the emails and saw that we were going to go all the way through verse 15, we are not. We're just going to go through verse 7 of chapter 2 this morning. So chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And the reason is, as I was looking at and reading, um, I was kind of starting to type up uh, my manuscript and I was getting kind of you know, 80% in, and I was still on those verses. And I'm like, man, there's just way too much, especially in terms of practical application for us. So we're just going to be in verses one through seven this morning. And um, it's, it really is carrying off of what Ronnie preached on out of the end of chapter one last week. So let's go ahead and read chapter two, verses one through seven in Colossians, and, and then jump right into the text this morning. So Colossians two, verses one through seven. Here's what Paul says. He says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So big idea this morning out of those verses, here it is, all right? We must, we must struggle with and for one another, providing encouragement and deep roots of faith. So we must struggle. This isn't a, um, if you get the chance to struggle with somebody, this is like as believers, as brothers and sisters, we must struggle with and for one another, providing encouragement and deep roots of faith. So between chapters one and two, now I don't, I don't really know who was responsible specifically, like what the person's name was for putting the chapter divisions in these letters, in these books in scripture. Cause you know, when Paul wrote this, it was just one manuscript. It was one letter. But whoever did it, I don't think they got it right with chapter 2, because chapter 2, where where Paul starts here, really is a continuation. It's kind of an emphasizing of what he was already saying in the end of chapter 1. So to put a break there, I don't think it it makes sense, but that's just me. But he really is just kind of continuing off, right? So the end of chapter 1, Paul says, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy, with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Verse 1 of chapter 2, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and all those who have not seen me. So he's saying, hey, here, I, I, I toil for this. I struggle for, uh, with, for, for you with all God's energy that he works within me. And I want you to know how great that struggle is. I want you to know so that you can be encouraged and, and grow together in faith. So it's a, a really easy transition out of the two. But here's what Paul's saying, right? Here's, here's my struggle, all right? Here's my struggle, end of chapter one. I struggle because I'm afflicted, I'm I'm in prison. Uh, I'm in prison for preaching the gospel, so that's my struggle. But I also want you to know that I struggle for you as you're facing these false teachers, right? It's, it's really, he's zeroing in on these Colossian believers in the beginning of chapter two. And he wants them to know, listen, I'm, I'm struggling for you guys day and night. I'm, I'm, I'm sweating, I'm, I'm praying, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting, I'm empathizing, like I'm, I'm burden filled and intentionally praying for you guys. And that's really about all he can do. So when Paul says, I'm struggling for you, it's struggling in prayer, right? He can't be present. He can't be there, like, fighting physically against these false teachers. He can't be there um, having debates and, and trying to encourage them, pres- like, with his presence. So the way that he struggles is by prayer and by, by angst and by, by empathy and, and, like, trying to, trying to put himself in their shoes and, and his heart breaking. And so he's, he's struggling for them. So, so what he does here in verses 1 through 5, and then 6 and 7 is, is a, another section, but 1 through 5, I've just kind of s- titled the section, Motivation for the Struggle. So Paul is struggling for these believers, right? I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. 
And there's a reason why I struggle. There's a motivation that's driving my struggle for you. So verses one through five, we've titled it, I've titled it Motivation for the Struggle. So in typical Paul run-on sentence fashion, what he does here with all of, the, all of these thoughts is he kind of just piles them on. Like here's the, here's the foundational thought and then on top of that is this and then there's this and then it all kind of leads to this. So the first thought, the first piece of this motivation is, is that their hearts may be encouraged. That's number one, that their hearts may be encouraged. This is in verse two, right? I, I struggle for you that their hearts, those who I have not seen may be encouraged. So this is the beginning effect, right? Paul is praying that when they hear how much he is struggling for them, how much time he's committing to praying for them, how, how, how burdened he is for them, even though he can't come physically, he's, he's painfully empathizing with their situation so that their hearts will be encouraged. When they hear about his struggle for them on their behalf, their hearts will be encouraged. Now, I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you. Maybe you have, but someone who, who commits to praying for you, someone who commits to praying for you, and they don't just commit to praying and then, you know, like they kind of drop it. It's like, hey, I'll pray for you, and then they never say anything about it. But someone who, pray, who says they'll pray for you, and then they, they follow up with you, right? They continually are asking how things are going, right? And they're, and they're praying with you in the moment. Maybe they're present with you, and as you're talking, they stop and pray for you right then and there, right? They're, they're committing their time and energy to, to lifting you up in prayer, to joining you in, in prayer. And when that happens, we tend to feel uplifted and we tend to feel strengthened. Like when someone is, is taking us to the throne in prayer, it, it does something to our spirit. It lifts our spirit. And it encourages us, right? Knowing that someone is making a sacrifice with their time to take our needs to the Lord in prayer. It's a powerful thing. So what Paul aims to do is he wants to ensure them, hey, listen, I'm fighting for you in prayer. I'm fighting for you in prayer. And I hope that when you hear of my sacrifice for you, that that will encourage you. Now, Paul, right, Paul, who had some, I'm sure had gained some serious notoriety at this point, right? Like he's, he's kind of like the, the, the missionary extraordinaire. He's the church planter extraordinaire. He's being used by God in a, in a, miraculous way based on his conversion like it's it's pretty incredible that this is Paul and you got to think of this this young church and, and they're going man Paul like that Paul is struggling on my behalf like me a, a new believer who's living in Colossae and, and Paul is in prison and he's got his own stuff to worry about but he's taking time to to lift me up in prayer and, and to lift up my struggles in prayer but a few months before we launched Family Church, I was at a, um, at, a, at a small little mini conference training, I guess you could call it, in South Carolina with our planting network. And while we were there, um, one of the men that was doing the training there is, he was one of the, one of the bigger well-known names in the church planting, church leadership, church discipleship. Um, like like movement. He's a really prominent author and speaker. And he was there, he was doing the training sessions. And um, I was also there with um, the, the, the network leader of this discipleship network. He, this guy has done tremendous things in, in the, the church planting world. And then I had GCC pastors, which is our network, were there and, and they're doing crazy things in Chicago and doing things in, in Pennsylvania and in tech, like these, these guys who are being used on a national scale. But before I left to come home, th those pastors, that leader of the discipleship network and this prominent leader in the church world, they all laid hands, I'm getting chills, they laid hands on me and they prayed for, for me and for our core team and for the launch of Family Church, me. Like the, these men who are nationally being, being used nationally for, for the gospel and the furtherance of, of the kingdom for the church, praying for me, a local little church pastor in Apex, North Carolina. Like, there was something that was so empowering in that, so encouraging that these men who, who have like so much on their plates and so much weight of responsibility and, and these massive ministries that they're leading, but yet take the time to, to sit and pray over me. And, there, and there's just something that's so encouraging and empowering in that. And so, so Paul is saying, listen, I, I struggle for you. Like I, I struggle for you. And it's not about that he had prominence. It's anybody that does that. Anyone that sacrifices time and energy on your behalf and takes your needs to the throne, it, 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 it's encouraging. So as, as these believers are encouraged, as they're strengthened, as they're invigorated really to carry on, 
Then they begin to look around, and this is the next kind of layer. They begin to look around at each other and go, man, you're, you're in this struggle with me. You're, you're in this fight with me. And in that, there's unity. And so they begin to, they begin to share in that fight together. And, and they begin to look at each other as people who can stand together for truth in the face of these false teachers. And that's, that's where he gets to number two, that, that he hopes that they are knit together. They're being knit together in love. So that's the second thing, right? Like, so, so I want you to hear of my struggle so that you're encouraged and that encouragement will lead to you guys being unified and knit together in love. And the way that they are knit together, it's, it's not that they're knit together in any other way, but Paul says, by their love for one another. So, so they care, right? they care deeply for one another. They care about um, the, the needs and, and they want all the, all the fellow believers, all the brothers and sisters to, to be, be strong in the faith, right? There's unity that abounds. There's concern for the well-being of others. They, they look around and they go, man, you're struggling. I want to come alongside you and I want to, I want to lift you up, right? There's a desire to help. They have a common enemy in the false teachers, like, like the false teachings, the false gospels. There's a common enemy there, so they're united there as well. So they're encouraged, they're strengthened by Paul's struggle for them, and then they band together in unity because of their love for one another, their love for Paul, and ultimately, and mo- most importantly, their love for Jesus. Now, when I was a student pastor, I'm going to take you back a little bit. There was a game that we liked to play, and um, Hayden, who's sitting here, he can attest to this because he played it. Um, but it was, re- it was one of my more favorite games that we would do at camps. So what we would do is we would have all of the students sit in a giant clump in the middle of a floor. And then once they were there, they would link arms, they would grab legs, they would link le- like whatever they could do to create one massive unit. Remember this game? And they would link up. And the, basically how the game would go is we would release the leaders and they would have to go and pry students off of each other. So, um, you know, maybe it doesn't sound fun, but I, 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 I thought it, did you think it was fun? Was it a fun game? No, it was fa- painfully, okay, I'll tell you why it wasn't fun because we always won. Um, but what you would do is you would go and you would try to like, you know, pry them off of each other. And if you got them to let go and release, then that person is out if they're separated. And then you would keep on going. And it wasn't a every, every man for himself. It was a team effort. It was students versus leaders. So what would we do, right? We would first obviously go for the middle schoolers because they were the easiest ones to get off. Then we would pick the weakest links and then we would join together and we would get like the bigger, stronger high schoolers. And, um, and we would do that. So what would happen is the bigger, stronger high schoolers would realize our tactic and they would begin to link up first with the weaker links. So they would start linking up with the small little middle schoolers, making it much more difficult for us to pry those middle schoolers off, right? So the stronger the stronger students would, would go and, and, and link up with the weaker students. Now, um, this, is, this illustration falls apart because um, when you put like 10 ultra competitive adult leaders in a game, um, we were undefeated, all right? So, but enough about my glory days. So, um, but as this young church is strengthened, right? Like as they're strengthened and, and they're looking and they're going, man, you're, you're straying and you're being pulled away. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come alongside of you and I'm gonna, I'm gonna help to redirect you and refocus you and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick you up when you fall and, and I'm gonna enter into your struggle and I'm gonna struggle with you and fight for you in prayer and, and I'm gonna be there for you and I'm gonna hold you accountable and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna strengthen you the best that I can through the power of Christ. And so, so this is what's happening, right? There's, there's unity and there's strength and they're being knit together. It's like when, when you know, literally something is being woven together and that's such a strong, a strong thing. And so this is what's happening. They're being, they're being knitted together, linked together in a way that is almost unbreakable. So as this happens, Paul gets to the next one. So they're encouraged, they band together. And then as that happens, it, Paul says they reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery. That's a long point, so we'll leave it up there if you're taking notes. But to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, he says. So this is, this is kind of the last step before he gives his real motivation. So not only are they reassured of their love for one another and, and the truth about Jesus, but Paul says they reach all the riches of assurance. All the riches of assurance. The riches of a knowledge and understanding of Christ are far too great for one sermon, In fact, Paul says in Ephesians 3 that the riches are unsearchable, and more truly that word means boundless. So the riches of Christ are 
are so much that we could never even count them. There's so, there's so many that we could never even begin to comprehend. But Paul does give us some in Ephesians 1, and there are many throughout Scripture. But here's just some of the riches of, of Christ, the knowledge of Christ. Ephesians 1 tells us that one of those is that we have redemption through the blood of Jesus. We have redemption. We have forgiveness of sins. We have the knowledge of the mystery of his will, which is to include all Gentiles and Jews in his plan for salvation. We have the message of truth. We know truth. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's one of the riches of the understanding and knowledge of Christ. We're guaranteed our inheritance. So there's these things that we, that we obtain. There's these riches that we get from having a knowledge of Jesus. And there's an assurance of these things. There's a confidence that, that comes with that. And so what Paul is saying is as you're encouraged, as you're knit together, as you're doing life together, and as you're preaching the gospel to one another in, in your struggles, then you're reassured and you're assured of the truth of those, those uh, riches. Right? As you're talking to one another, you, you're, you're reminded that, yes, this is real. Because, and why is that important? Because there's, there's these false teachings and there's these, these false teachers that are coming in and they're pulling these believers away and, and their message sounds good and it's an emotionally driven message and, and it's a logical message if, if, you, if you get down to the logic of it and we'll talk about that. But what he's saying is like, like band together and, and preach the gospel to one another and, and find solid ground in those, those truths. And so, so there's this progression that Paul lays out here, right? There's a progression here. He says, look, I, I'm struggling for you. I want you to know about the struggle. I want you to, to hear about the struggle. And when you hear about the struggle, I want you to be encouraged and strengthened. As you're being encouraged and looking around going, yeah, I can continue forward. And then he's in the fight and she's in the fight and she's in the fight. And you're going to band together. You come alongside each other in love. And as you do this, you're going to have clarity of understanding around Jesus, around who he is, around what he did. You'll have assurance and confidence in what you know to be true. So this is the progression that happens. But, but why? What is the grand motivation that, that Paul is saying? Here's what I want to happen in your life. And here's really the motivation. Here's verse four. I say this, right? I say all of these things in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. No one may delude you with plausible arguments. Let's talk about those two words real quick. Delude. It means to reason beside or alongside truth. So you take truth and you use that truth to argue, but most truly in, in the Greek, it means to reckon wrong or to reason falsely, so to deceive. So you take truth and then you kind of argue that truth away and, and you do it in such a way that it still kind of sounds like truth, but there's some differences that, does, that, that takes the truth away from that, that statement or that belief. So that's delude, right? It, it means to deceive by false reasoning, but it also carries the idea that there's, there's a certain charm about it. So it's not just like accusation and you're wrong and this, but it's, there's like a charm with how you present it and how these, how these teachers are presenting it. And then plausible means seeming reasonable or probable, right? So delude with, well, I, I lost it. What's four again? Oh, yeah. Delude with plausible arguments. Argue away the truth with things that sound like it makes sense. So the false teachers aren't just lobbying, they're not just lobbying outrageous teachings about Jesus at the Colossian believers. They're not just saying like, you know, um, you know Jesus is a, you know, the brother of, of Satan, which is some people believe that. Like, yeah, he's the brother of, of, of Satan. Like, that's, that's not what they were saying. What they were doing is they were taking the truth about Jesus and they were explaining away his deity in a way that seemed logical. For instance, imagine these questions, right? Well, how could God, how could God in all his glory really be contained in a human being? Right, how could that be possible? How could a human in flesh really contain God? How, how, how is that possible? Why would God leave glory and come to this earth, especially in the form of a servant, like the lowest of low? How, why would God do that? If Jesus were really God, why didn't he just come down off the cross? Right, he's powerful enough. Why didn't he, isn't there another way? Like if he was really God, then I'm sure there was another way than him having to die and, and, and be sacrificed on a cross. Right? So they take the truth about Jesus and they go, yeah, but, I mean, wouldn't it make more sense? Like, doesn't it seem more plausible that this is actually the truth? And so they would say it in such a way that you're, you're kind of going, yeah, I mean, it, it does, yeah, how could God, yeah, how could that? And so they were pulling people away with these, these arguments and logic and, and reason, and they were explaining away the deity of Jesus. 
So Paul's like, man, enough is enough. Enough is enough. You aren't alone in this. I'm struggling for you. I'm struggling with you. So stay strong. Stand together. Remind yourselves often of who Jesus is and and what you know to be true about him. Right? That conviction that you have that brought you to repentance in the first place. Be reminded of that. A belief that has become prominent. Now, this is, this is really important for us, right? Like, there's a belief that's become prominent in, in, our, in our society, in our culture. And I think this is where we take pause for a minute and, and really, like, dive into some application. And this is why I think I went, man, there's just too much here to, to go all the way through verse 15. Because this is so relevant. This is so relevant for us today when you think about false teachers and plausible arguments and taking truth and skewing that truth in such a way that you go, yeah, man, like if my emotion drives this thing, then I can definitely get there. If my emotion, if what feels better, if what feels best is driving what I believe, then yeah, I can totally get to a place that that isn't really truth. So it's important that we pause. And, and when we talk about this, maybe as we talk through this, maybe, maybe something or someone will come to mind. Maybe there's a church that you know of that's abandoned truth. Maybe there's a church that you know of that, that has kind of walked away from the truth of Scripture, even though they say they haven't. And they're saying, yeah, but Scripture actually, yeah, but wouldn't it make more sense? Yeah, but wouldn't it feel better? And they take the truth, and, and maybe a, a church comes to mind. Um, you know, they, they want to attract more people. They want to be more relevant. So how can I attract more people? I need to water down the message of the gospel. It, it can't be so demanding to be a disciple. It can't require much of people or else they're not going to come. So I need to, uh, to preach a gospel that doesn't require much so that people will want to be involved in my church. So the belief is, right, that my truth needs to be based on or should be based on my, my emotion and what I feel to be right, then what scripture actually says. Let me just give you an example, all right? So delude with plausible arguments. I was reading an article this week, and um, by the way, whenever I throw out an article or throw out something, if you guys are interested in reading the whole thing, I, I like bookmark my links. So if you're ever like, hey man, I'd love to read that article, I'll send it your way, just let me know after, after the service. But I was reading an article this week, and here's what it was called. It was called The Gospel of Ear Tickling, all right? The Gospel of Ear Tickling. It's by a guy named, a pastor named Joe McKeever, and here's an illustration that he begins with. He says, in the Peanuts comic strip, the children were writing an assignment about their summer vacation. Linus was hard at work. He wrote something like, even though I had a lot of fun this summer, at the beach, going to movies, playing ball, and vacationing with my family, I could not wait to return to the hallowed halls of learning. I missed my amazing school, my wonderful books, and my outstanding teacher, I'm so happy to be back. He handed in the paper and then stood there while the teacher read it. He says, an A plus? Thank you very much, ma'am. As he leaves the room, he remarks to another child, as the years come and go, one learns what sells. Here's what the author says. Many a pastor has figured out what sells and has determined to offer a steady menu of that to their congregation. And I would even add, even if it means twisting the truth of scripture, to make people feel better. So let me give you an an example, all right? And this is an older book, but but very relevant today. Rob Bell, who you may know, he's a prominent pastor in the early to mid 2000s. He wrote a book years ago, 2012, called Love Wins. Not sure if you've heard of this book, um, Love Wins. In it, here's what Bell says, quote, the gospel is exclusive, but also inclusive in that people worldwide will be saved even if they have not professed Christ. He continues, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What Jesus doesn't say is how or when or in what manner the mechanism functions that gets people to God through him. What Jesus does is declare that he and he alone is saving everybody, and then he leaves the door way, way open, creating all sorts of possibilities. He is as narrow as himself and as wide as the universe. (laughs) <laughs> just, it just sounds crazy to me. But Bell also claims in his book that hell is not a real place. But it's just a metaphor for the extreme difficulties that we face on earth. That's love wins. There's no hell. Love ultimately will win and everyone will be saved. You know what that's called? Universalism. This is why I say it's relevant today. Now here's the thing, right? Rob Bell is a really good writer. I have a few of his books. He's, he's a tremendous author. And the way in which he words things, it's like, man, I... 
this is a good, it's a good, easy read. And it, and it kind of, like some of the ways he describes things, it kind of makes sense. I've read a few of them. I own a few of his books. Um, he uses scripture to, to defend his points. Not the way scripture was intended to be used, but he takes it out of context and uses it to defend his points, even though it's misinterpreted. But it sounds good. But it sounds good. Everyone in the end is going to be saved no matter what. That sounds great. But it's not truth. And even though that book was written in 2012, this is a growing, and I would say even more commonly held than then, it's, it's called universalism, right? Like everyone is going to be saved. The belief that all human beings will eventually be saved no matter what. Taking the truth of Scripture, diluting it with plausible argument. Now, Jesus did say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? No man comes to the Father but through me. But he also said in Matthew 7, 13, and 14, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. How could you be more clear than what Jesus just said? The gate is wide for those that aren't going to make it. The gate is very narrow for those that will receive eternal life. Like Jesus said that. So to miss those parts of scripture and say, well, that's not what Jesus meant, or he was talking to the Pharisees, so he only was talking to the Pharisees because to get out of their religious system, that would be really hard. Like people can take that and argue it away, but it's very clear. It's very clear what Jesus says. But what feels better, right? What feels better? Man, it feels way better just to go, man, like you're, you're messed up now, but there's hope because one day, everyone's going to be in heaven with Jesus. Take some of the weight of responsibility off of us, right? Like I can just live my life and whatever I do, like I can just kind of, you know, eat, drink and be merry because one day, but which is truth, right? Like that everyone will make it feels good. That the gate is narrow doesn't feel good, but it's truth. And so, so what we've done is we've taken truth and we've, we've, we've twisted it and, and made it into something that is all about feeling good so that we can fill our seats and and I don't <laughs> anyways so how can we let, let, let's let's talk about let's talk about a few more practical things how can we be sure that we aren't swayed all right if this is happening in our world and there's there's many more examples right that's one of the big ones universalism how can we be sure that we aren't swayed by the feel good ear tickling gospel messages that are growing in our world how can we be sure that we remain steadfast paul says it verses 6 through 7 Therefore, okay, therefore, because of all this, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And I just titled this encouragement. I think I have that up there. Um, just encouragement. Therefore, he says, because of your firmness of faith, because you are banded together with one another in love, because you understand and have the knowledge of the riches of Christ, because of that, Remember that infancy of, of your faith, right? Remember the teachings about Jesus. Remember what you experienced about Jesus and, and walk in him. So walk in Christ. Now, how do we stand firm and fight against the false teaching? Well, let verse 7 paint a picture for you this morning, right? Rooted, built up, established, and abounding. I just think about a tree when I hear that. Kind of sounds like the, the tree, right? Like rooted, built up, and then established. So now the roots are like really digging in and then abounding, bearing much fruit. Listen to these passages. Psalm 1, 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. That's talking about a righteous man. Psalm 92, 12 through 14. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. And they are ever full of sap and green. And then Jeremiah 17, 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For its leaves remain green, and he's not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Rooted, built up, established, and abounding. But how do we get there? Like, it's all good to say it, 
But how do we get there? Like, how do I make sure that I'm being established, that my roots are growing deeper, that I'm, that I'm gaining more of an understanding and knowledge about Jesus and about God and about how he works and about his character? How do I make sure that I, that I can say that about myself, about my life? Rooted, built up, established, abounding. Because if that's you, then when those false teachings come, come flying in, when the wind blows them in, and you're tempted to go, yeah, that sounds really nice, but, but no, I'm, I'm rooted and I'm built up and I'm established and, and I'm abounding. So how do we get there as a church, as individuals and as a church? Well, here's a few practical ways, all right? The, the most obvious ones are on Sunday mornings, right? We're committed here to preaching scripture. We're committed here just to preaching truth, to preaching scripture. So that's one way, right? Like I'm, I'm listening, I'm learning, I'm taking notes, I'm highlighting, I'm underlining, and then during the week I'm going back to that passage. And then when I, when I go to my city group, that's the second way, right? City groups, I'm, we're diving a little bit deeper into the text. I'm sharing about what God's doing in my life. That allows other people to speak into that, to, to enter into my struggle, to pray for me, to lift me up, to encourage me. But that's only twice a week. And that's for only like an hour, hour and a half each time. So all the other hours, all the other days, what am I doing to make sure that I'm, I'm solid, I'm, I'm established, that I'm, 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 you know, solid in my understanding of Scripture? Like, how do I make sure I'm there, that I'm firm in understanding? Here's, a, here's something that I, that, that's coming this week, and the only reason it's not yet is because I'm waiting. But you guys know the Bible app, right, the Bible app? Um, so we have a church account that's just waiting to be verified. And as soon as they verify that church account, we're going to start putting out reading plans for the church. So you jump on, because I think oftentimes it's like, I got to get in God's word, but I don't know where to start. And then we go, all right, I'll read that. Um, and, you know, then you're in Deuteronomy. You're like, that was okay. Um, but instead, what we're going to do is we're in, and I've been having some good conversations um, about, like, discipleship and how we're going deeper and, and what does that look like for our church. And, and I think we got to start with just making sure we're rooted, making sure that we're, we're, you know, built up and being built up. And then eventually, like, we're established in our faith. And then when we're doing that individually and corporately, then we're just this knitted together in love force that, like, like I don't say bring it on because no one wants to fight it, but, like, bring it on. Like, we know the truth of Scripture. So, so what we're going to do is one that hopefully it'll get approved, like, tomorrow or Tuesday, but we're going to just start having reading plans every day. And you can set an alert on it, and it'll just provide something for you to read. It'll provide you with that, that morning or evening or whenever you read. Maybe you don't know where to start. And it'll, it'll just be something that makes sense, that's fluid, and that, and that goes in order, right? Like, that's one way, one way we're going to do. So here's kind of the, 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 the ending application for us, right? Like, we've got to be intentional with our pursuit of Jesus privately. We have to be. We have to be intentional privately. We have to be in Scripture. And, you know, in, in, in student ministries, it was always like, you got to do it daily. But then you're like, man, these are 13 and 14-year-olds. How about just try for, like, a few times a week? Like, let's just try to start somewhere slow. Like, maybe three to four times a week, right? And then once you kind of get that, then let's go to daily, right? But I think we sometimes, we, we don't say daily. It's like, well, just do it when you can, right? When you have time during the week, like, make time for it and just make sure. Like, we got to be in it daily, daily because what else are we doing daily right filling our minds with all kinds of other stuff but are we filling our minds daily with the word of god so we've got to do that personally and privately first and then we need to be intentional with how we relate to other people so how, how does it look to enter into someone's struggle how does it look to be praying for somebody how does it look to take the extra step and and go and you know take them food when they're when they're you know sick well don't take them food Take them chicken noodle soup, I guess. Don't take them anything fried. But like, how do I serve people? How do I, how do I get into their struggle and make sure that I'm meeting their needs? And we got to be intentional relationally. We have to be intentional sharing our struggles with our brothers and sisters. Do not struggle alone. Don't struggle alone. We weren't meant to. We weren't meant to go through this life alone. We were created for relationship. We were, we were created to be involved in other people's lives and have them involved in ours. So Tear down the wall. Don't, don't, be, don't be like numb to opening up your feelings, you know. I, I think especially men, there's like this stigma that like men shouldn't show emotion and, and we shouldn't talk about our feelings. Like talk about your feelings. Go out with a guy and grab some wings and just talk about feelings, man. Have a good cry over, over some wings. 
Um, and if, if you like get two, just say, well, it's the wings, it's too hot, you know. Um, but be intentional with sharing, right? Like love, love people. Also lovingly correct people. When you see them drifting off course, when you see that maybe they're starting to maybe buy into some things and, and you, you hear some things and you go, okay, that doesn't sound right. Um, let's go to scripture and see what God says. And let's talk about this. All right, let's break this down and let's get into a conversation and really work through this together. But, but, but enter into that and, and lovingly correct, right? Like don't come in and like, the Bible. Um, you know, like come in and, and open it and be like, hey, let's, let's walk through this together. And I want to make sure we're on the same page. I want to make sure that we really understand what God says about this issue. We've got to be diligent. We've got to be intentional. We've got to hold fast. We've got to hold tightly to the truth of the gospel. Being rooted, built up, established, and abounding, Paul says, in thankfulness towards God. It all leads to thankfulness because of who God is and what he's done in our life. So this is Paul's encouragement. This is his struggle for them. This is, uh, we'll get kind of to a warning, but more encouragement next week. But I just felt like, man, we got to really just pause and, and let that sink in because of what we see in our world and how important it is for us to be established in our faith. So let's pray. And, and Bain, you guys can come on up. And um, we, we, for the first time last week, did this. So if you weren't here last week, um, we're changing up how we're doing communion. Uh, we ran out of those little cups and they were getting sour anyway. So um, we're going to go back to a more traditional uh, kind of way of doing communion, but we're not going to pass. Uh, we have the communion table set right, right there at the end, um, at the back of the aisle. And um, what we're going to do is the band is going to play, and as they're, as they're playing this song,